what we know long-term health studies from both Stanford and Harvard is people that chose occupations or creative outputs and avenues that were connected inherently to their creativity or to what they loved doing had longevity arcs of more health and vibrancy. Hey, it's Rocky. Welcome to Richer Soul. Today's guest is Ron Alexander, who's going to share how to unlock your creativity. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life, to wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward? How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time, and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and create harmony to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. Today's quote comes from Paul McCartney and the song Yesterday. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Suddenly, I'm not half the man I used to be. There's a shadow hanging over me. We're going to chat about that quote today and how it came to be. I do hope your troubles are not here to stay and you are not half the person you used to be. If so, maybe we can solve that today. I've been reading about how much of our childhood affects our adulthood and how many scripts are still running that control us and our thoughts. My goal for this year is to reprogram them all. Each time I see one, I find another layer. Society doesn't help much either. If anything, they want you to keep acting the way that you do. Too often kids lose their creativity as they go through school. We should not. And if you have, to take it back. Just go ahead and take back that creativity and do what you love. Who cares what other people think? Today, we're going to go deep on that and how to step out of fear and do something for you. It's a new year. Most people are already giving up. Don't be one of those. We'll provide some action steps and ideas to help you build wealth, be more creative, and enjoy life with our guest today. Dr. Ronald Alexander is a psychotherapist, a mindfulness trainer, and a creativity, business, and leadership coach. He has a private psychotherapy and executive coaching practice in Santa Monica, California. He's the executive director of the Open Mind Training Program that offers personal and professional training programs in mindfulness-based mind-body therapies, transformational leadership, and meditation. We're here to chat about his new book, Core Creativity, The Mindful Way to Unlock Your Creative Self. Let's meet Dr. Alexander. Welcome to Richer Soul, Dr. Ron Alexander. It's great to have you join us today. Oh, thank you very much. And I'm excited to learn from you today. Before we do, let's start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? Well, my father worked in the telephone company, which then became AT&T for 45 years. And 
very early on, around age 10, I had fine taste for clothing. Because my aunt, who was a banker in Boston, took me to Brooks Brothers when I was about nine or 10. And so I saw these tweed jackets and uh, button down shirts. And there was these, this pair of English Walker shoes. I think they were like black and white saddle shoes, but they came from London. And I remember telling my aunt, oh, I want those. And she said, um, good, great. Um, what are you willing to do to earn them? And so um, over the course of many, many summers, she had season tickets at Fenway Park behind a home plate. And uh, anytime I expressed a desire for pretty much anything, she would say to me, so what are you willing to do to earn that? So around age 12, there was a neighbor and they had a greenhouse. Um, and this is, you know, in Boston. And so in the winter, uh, all the plant potting of plants was done in this plastic greenhouse, but it needed uh, weeding and watering and fertilizing. And so one of my close friends um, in, high, in junior high school uh, asked me if I wanted to come and to work for him and his father uh, two or three hours every afternoon, which I did. And um, he was being mentored by one of his uncles about um, investing in stocks. And we were 12 years old. So I asked my parents if I could open up a bank account um, in Boston and then uh, involve myself in the purchase of some stocks. And they actually really didn't know much about stocks, but um, they gave me permission. And then I went to work at another greenhouse, which was a very large flower uh, potting um, an agricultural farm. And uh, I started out again, potting and planting and weeding. And then over time, they actually invited me when I got to be about 14, 15, 16, to be one of the main potters um, for Memorial Day, Labor Day, Fourth of July, Mother's Day, Father's Day, to put arrangements of many, many types of uh, various flowers into uh, an arranged pot. Um, so I was bringing in, I think back then, um, 60 cents an hour. And, and I would work 20 to 30 hours a week. And to me, that was a fortune. And so I started to save. I, I, I also started to buy very fancy clothes, which to this day I still enjoy. But I also invested a certain percent of that money in the stock market. And somewhere along the line, I don't remember who it was or whose father or parent said, you have $100 in your bank account. Ron. And I said, yeah. And they said, would you like to have a thousand? And I said, sure. And so he explained to me the law of 10 so that every time that you earn $10, what you want to do is, if possible, put five to seven of it away in savings and then use that to invest in the stock market. And so I did that all through uh, adolescence and uh, throughout my entire life to this day. Whatever income I earn, I squirrel away a very large portion of it for savings and investment. Um, I've lived a very Zen life. Um, I've been very fortunate professionally having a psychotherapy and an executive and creativity coaching practice here in Hollywood where I've worked in the entertainment uh, industry, television, film, music, and then in the last 15 to 20 years, the dot-com uh, industry. And so the, accumul the receiving of money for what I do in terms of uh, my skill set, uh, it's always been an abundance um, of money coming in. And I've always applied that, that principle of take what you get, save, and then invest. Take what you get, spend a little, save, and invest. And so I've become comfortable at this stage in, in my life. I know the power of compounding. Yes. I have to say, if you've done what you said you've done, 
you're extremely comfortable. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. We encourage that. That's right. The power of compounding. That's what I was searching for. You know, that compounding. And so that $100, like three or four years later as at adolescent became a thousand. And then that thousand dollars many years later became much more. You know, and that's the one thing that I think I was taught or I picked up at a young age. Your first thousand dollars is the hardest. Your second thousand is easy. Your Mm -hmm. first 10,000 is hard. Your second 10,000 is easy. And that goes all your first million is hard. Your yes. second million is easy. Like if you can hit that first milestone and you do what you're talking about, the second one comes in rapid succession. Yes. And I, I also learned, you know, very early on, my parents and my aunt um, and the parent of one of my chums in high school is to do what you love and the money will come to always focus not on the accumulation of money because what, you know, what is money uh, in terms of creativity? Uh, Money is really how creative you are about how you develop, how you imagine, how you invent, how you envision your personal, your professional and your spiritual life. And so I I always, um, of course, never lived beyond my means. And as I said, you know, money, some some of us have a golden touch when it comes to money. It just, it, it's around, it's always around us. Um, And I always lived beneath my means. I mean, for example, uh, I had an accountant and for years he used to say to me, oh, you should buy a bigger house because I really love my very comfortable Zen home. Uh, in Southern California, up in the Santa Monica Mountains. Or you should buy a more expensive car. And I used to laugh and say, what would I do with a a bigger home? I love my home. And what would I do with a a more expensive car? It just seems to be uh, a waste. And so I've always lived beneath my means. And I focused on doing things that gave me a wonderful sense of creativity and, and manifesting, whether it was manifesting a program at a college or university uh, that I taught at, uh, or manifesting uh, workshops and training programs for professionals all around the world. Um, I've always been very inventive, um, but it comes not from focusing on, well, how much money do I want to make? It's much more of been, how creative do I want to be? And how enlivened do I want to uh, experience myself? And so even though I've been a, in private practice uh, as a licensed psychotherapist and uh, leadership coach for 46 years now, um, when I started out, one of my mentors said to me, you know, you're very, ca- you're very capable, you're very gifted. And you're, um, when I was growing up, I became involved in the Boy Scouts and there are certain ranks that you go through tenderfoot, second class, first class, and then you advance kind of like graduate school, star, and then you become life, and then you uh, apply to become an Eagle Scout, which is a very, very high ranking um, in the Boy Scouts of America. And so I always had a sense of envisioning for myself certain goals, certain expectations. But again, I always focused on how I could utilize all of my different resources and capacities. And so when I started my private practice in West Hollywood at Cedar sinai Medical Office Tower, I created one of the very first, along with several other co-creators, holistic behavioral and medical uh, holistic health uh, healing clinics between 1980, uh, 78 and 1984, we were there. And it was called the Center for uh, Health and and Healing. And I always focused on not only seeing patients and doing group therapy, but then teaching workshops on weekends, then working uh, as an adjunct uh, professor, teaching at various colleges and universities, and having a multiplicity of avenues where I could feel creative. 
And in my book called Creativity, um, I talk about how you want to hold visions and have seed thoughts for yourself so that if you're planting a seed in one part of the landscape um, of yourself, simultaneously you should also be thinking about, well, what's the next seed I'm going to be planting? So as this plant is growing, well, this plant can be growing. And then like writing books, that's an, another whole plant. And then I'm, I'm building a um, mind body, an international mind body institute in Shanghai uh, as soon as the Chinese government allows um, the COVID uh, lockdown to uh, disappear. And I'll be involved in that. And so I'm always engaged in using my creativity in manifesting money as a result of that. Just out of curiosity, do you know why your CPA wanted you to spend more money all the time? Usually they're not so uh, spendthrift. He would always say to me, you're paying so much money in taxes that if you have a bigger house, you'll have a higher mortgage deduction. If you pay twice the amount on your lease, Uncle Sam will be paying for that. But I never really um, gave into that way of thinking. It just didn't sit right with me. It doesn't sit right with me. I'd rather keep the dollar, right, than right. save 30 cents. I'm still ahead by 70 cents. <laughs> and that's why you're you and I'm me and, you know, <laughs> we're in the, the driver's seats that we're in. Well, and you would expect somebody, and I've talked about the CPAs all the time, and, and part of it is they don't want to get yelled at for your high taxes. And mm -hmm. so they just tell you to spend more money so they they don't get yelled at for high taxes because you don't usually blame the government. You tend to blame your CPA. So it's just kind of funny. <laughs> My former father-in-law, his name was um, Phil Philip Yasny from New Jersey, and he was a uh, small-time entrepreneur. And uh, very early on, he had a very funny sense of humor. He would say things like, um, keep your eye focused on the donut and not on the hole. Uh, and your life is a bowl of uh, strawberries. And another thing that he used to say, and I always took it to heart because uh, he had wisdom. And I was in my early 20s uh, when I met him. Is he said, um, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. In meaning, pay your taxes, don't cut corners, uh, and then you, you can sleep at night. And in Buddhism, because I'm involved in um, Zen Buddhism and, and mindfulness uh, and Theravadan Buddhism, is we say that um, right livelihood, you know, right speech, right action, right livelihood are all fundamental principles of how to live a very awakened in conscious life. It seemed like a lot of these people early in your life were ahead of their time in the way they were thinking. Yeah. The father of that first greenhouse guy, he worked at Procter & Gamble uh, during the day. And he spent, he got out uh, like around three o'clock in the afternoon because he went in like at either six or seven in the morning. And he would spend his afternoons and early evenings and most of Saturday and always take off uh, Sundays um, working, developing the greenhouse and, and the flower uh, garden. And that's when he introduced to me the notion of, well, most people only have one horse when it comes to uh, finances and career. But if you get two horses now you have two horses that are pulling the wagon. And then when you get two horses, think about adding a third and then adding a fourth horse and then adding a fifth horse. And then how light is the wagon going to be and how much you can carry in the wagon? So most of these individuals, yeah, they were really way, way uh, ahead of their time. And the um, my aunt, who was the banker, and my friend's uh, father, who worked for Kodak uh, Camera, uh, his name was Mr. Lundgren um, in Boston, uh, he would always tell me the future um, is in the two things, the stock market and real estate. And those are the two kind of pillars of investments uh, that I've always been in involved in. 
quite interesting. I know at one point, I think we had seven horses pulling for us, which was real nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Now yeah, we tuned it back a little bit just so we have, we don't need that many horses anymore. <laughs> Life has gotten easy. So it's quite okay. But yeah, we're actually probably picking up a few new ones and we'll see what the, what the future holds. And what did you call the compounding? You called it's it. Just, um, it's just con- yeah. It's simple compounding. The power of compounding. A penny double becomes two pennies. Becomes four pennies. Becomes eight, sixteen, thirty-two. Yeah. Like it goes fast, and right. it's amazing. Right. In that early first hundred dollars that I earned at age eleven, became a thousand dollars, and then that thousand dollars every eight years, and then of course when you get into private practice and you're know, consulting for uh, record companies and film studios, everything s- continues to compound. And then you arrive at a place where what you're primarily focusing on is how you can contribute to helping other people grow and manifest their visions and to have more abundance uh, in their lives so that it, it becomes more about what you can do to interlink to help share the wealth, so to speak, with ideas and um, supporting people in in their platforms and, and uh, brainstorming with them about their brand ideas. And then at the same time, being able to comment from a place of wisdom about cockamamie ideas. And like someone just brought me an idea the other day and I said, oh, no, 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 no. I don't think I, I, I want to invest in that. No, 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 no. Um, I said, I think you, you would be m- much more uh, frugal if you would hold on to your money at this moment and just wait for the next two years to see what happens with the um, the stock market and do we go into a recession or we don't go into a recession. And the next day I read in the newspaper, um, I mean the internet, that Jeff Bezos said something very similar, like, this is not a time to go out and buy big flat screen screen TVs or to get that big expensive car. And that was interesting to see someone whose entire business model is about selling things. Um, but here he is because he was asked the big question and he said, no, next year or two, pull your belt in, spend less. And that reminds me too, in my early 20s, I came across this um motivation coach his name was uh jim roan i've heard of jim yeah and uh at that time tony robbins was uh only 20 years old i was a few years older than 20 tony i maybe four or five years older i think and tony was running his california offices as the uh director and um tony was the warm-up act for jim roan and uh, you can imagine a 20-year-old testosterone-filled Tony Robbins, right, as the warm act. And I remember turning to uh, my wife uh, at the time and said, wow, if he's the warm-up act, who's coming, you know? Um, and, of course, Jim Rohn was brilliant and very inspiring. Um, and he offered something that, to this day, I teach and I apply when I'm uh, doing coaching and that's you have to in springtime, you plan summertime uh, in early fall, you reap, but you have to plan for winters economically because the winter always comes in anyone in financial management um, and uh, wealth uh, management tells you that too, that, no matter how high the highs are, the stock market's going to go up and it's going to go down. Um, Real estate market goes up and it comes down. That things are cyclical. And in creativity thinking, um, everything is cyclical also. You know, we have times where uh, I wrote in one of the chapters in my book called Creativity, I wrote about that you have to plan for seasons of where you feel incredibly creative and you're just filled with energy and ideas and you're in, envisioning things and then you're uh, building things and implementing things. 
And then there's a time period where then things slow down and it's um, it's like a valley uh, after you've been up uh, on the mountain. And it's important in one's um, rhythm of work, life, rest, experience to plan for those cycles. Somebody forgot to tell the Fed that there are cycles and that we need to let things go because that's what wipes out the wastage in the economy. That's what allows it to reset. That's what allows new opportunities to come in and take over. And when you don't allow that to happen, you create worse problems and worse cycles and you don't allow great new things to spring up. And I don't think people realize like many uh, new companies come around during the downturn. So you have to have ups and downs. You have to have spring as much as you have to have winter. And Mm -hmm. I'm very much a believer in, in that philosophy and you plan for it. And you also understand that it's okay. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means we're in this cycle. And in this cycle, we behave this way. And this too shall pass. And then you get a nice cycle where it takes off again. And you can see them coming and going. You just have to be aware and watchful. In my first book, Wise Mind, Open Mind, I talked about, I was down in Australia on a teaching tour uh, for four to six weeks in 2008. And the crash was in October. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it was August, uh, early September. And um, I had an intuitive dream because that's part of what I thought about in the first book, Why Is My Open Mind? And in the second book, Core Creativity. And I dreamt Wall Street Journal, stock market crashes, worst since uh, history, uh, 1929. So I call up my, my business manager, uh, the next day. And I say, let's move everything to cash. And he says, why? And I said, uh, well, I had this dream. And um, he, I tell him the dream. And he says, if I moved everybody uh, in and out of their portfolio based upon dreams or going to a psychic or consulting the Oracle, um, nobody would ever uh, get anywhere. Well, he didn't move me out. And now he calls me up and he says, have you had any more dreams lately? And so um, I, I told him recently, I said, well, I haven't yet, but if I do, let's act on it. And that's, you know, in the new book uh, on creativity, I talk about it's really important to follow and monitor your dreams, you know, whether they are symbolic or they're actually concrete. Um, and that was a really concrete uh, deeply intuitive dream um, because it, 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 everything crashed. However, cycles, I relaxed. I didn't, I didn't get anxious. I, I know that what goes down comes up. I wrote it to the bottom. Then I wrote up the portfolio and everything is, you know, as good as can be. Although in this last year, we've been in a down cycle, but I trust that We'll be in an up cycle at some point in time. Always are. Yeah. And the important thing is to stay grounded and connected to yourself rather than to let the, the mind talk, particularly anxiety and fear. And then going like to the gym and listening to all the guys there talking anxiety and fear and what they're going to do and how they're selling everything out. It's to not listen to any of that. That's just a lot of chatter. You know, the talking heads, same thing on television. It's much more important to embrace a more meditative path to staying grounded um, and being, again, less concerned about the down cycle. But when we're in a down cycle, just like when we were in COVID, I came out with a new book, is to use the down cycle as a very fertile and creative and imaginative time to make something new. And when I was a young man in my 20s, I did a lot of studying of what would you call the robber barons because I came from Boston and 
Carnegie's and the Mellons and the Rockefellers and the Disney. And I, you know, I've, I've read everything I could possibly read to uh, distill in Ghana. Well, what are the formulas of success? And what I oftentimes when I'm coaching people uh, who are in business is asking them to tell me what's your winning formula? Because in business, winning formulas are formulaic and success in business is often formulaic. So even if you've made hundreds of millions of dollars and then you lost hundreds of it's a million dollars. If you stay identified with your skill sets of what you bring to a financial conversation of called investment, that you can recreate because success in business is formulaic. You just have to take the formula, find the winning formula that you used on X, Y, or Z, and then reapply it to the invention of something new and not to lose hope. That's very true. Business is extremely formulaic. Figuring out the equation of the business isn't always easy, but once you do and you can fine tune it, it hums along quite well. Today's episode is sponsored by Profit Answer Man Podcast. Did you know that most small business owners hate looking at their financials? It's one reason they may struggle with business success. The Profit Answer Man podcast helps them ensure they are profitable and can pay their employees and weather the storms we all have to face. It's built on the profit first methodology of pay yourself first. The Profit Answer Man podcast is a must listen to for every small business owner and anyone who wants to help them survive and thrive. Check it out on your favorite listening platform. So you've talked a little bit about the book. What inspired you to write the book, Core Creativity, The Mindful Way to Unlock Your Creative Self? I would say about 44 years of working in the entertainment industry, t television, film, music. Um, and then in the dot-com uh, industry and having a, a very firsthand uh, experience and knowledge base of working with what I call core creatives. And um, I was always uh, very much moved very early on in my career because I was teaching yoga and uh, meditation, both Zen meditation and uh, mindfulness meditation. And many of my patients, because they were in the entertainment industry, a lot of them suffered from uh, bipolar disorder, um, which is manic moods, great outbursts of creativity, followed by profound uh, depression and periods of very, very uh, darkness. And so I began to teach them yoga and meditation to kind of quiet and take some of the edge off the mania and simultaneously lift up the nervous system um, from the depressive pole. And then, of course, uh, when we came across lithium, um, that, which is a cell salt, um, comes from the earth, that uh, bipolar disorder could be given a floor. And so that a person could continue to have an up and down but instead of an up like this and a down like that, the ups and downs were more like this, the more manageable. And so I was really fascinated with how do people create? Like, how does someone, like Paul McCartney, for example, um, he dreamt his masterpiece yesterday. It's been re-recorded over 375 times historically. Um, and many, many uh, musicians that um, I've uh, worked with and, and interviewed have said that they listen to their dreams, they uh, meditate, many have some form of a spiritual discipline. Some people practice yoga, some creatives practice Tai Chi, uh, or Qigong, um, Tai Chi, 
And almost every creative I interviewed in the book did what was became famous and known. And it really comes from the Taoist uh, tradition of uh, philosophy and meditation is taking the daily walk. And the most famous person, I think, that we, in modern day history, uh, who was most renowned for taking the, the daily walk in order to be with his more creative mind was Steve Jobs. And whether he was trying to figure out uh, a business uh, decision or a creative design decision or when he was hired back for a dollar a year to take over uh, the, and become the CEO of uh, Apple again, um, there were like 12 different uh, Apple products. And he went in front of uh, the team and he put up on the, the board four products. And one of those four, and he said, we're going to get rid of the other eight. And one of those four was the iMac. And if you can remember, the John, Johnny Ivy and the design team, it was like a half of a dome um, and then like portable screens, so to speak. And it came in like 10, 12 different uh, colors. And that came from one of his walks of thinking of taking everything f from 12 products and paring it down to four and then running with the four. And so it's really important that people take time, whether it's a daily walk, to immerse themselves in nature because nature nurtures your own soul's nature. And, and Nate, by being in nature, you get closer to your own inner nature. And your own inner nature always has a component of a stream of intuition. And I know for me, I like to go on the daily walk or a bike ride or take a long swim when I'm in uh, Hawaii or in, in Greece. And I get many, many, many creative ideas, particularly for writing um, when I'm in Greece and I'm swimming. Sometimes I get a whole chapter from a, an hour, an hour and a half swim that gets downloaded for, for me. So the idea of the book Core Creativity came out of um, two things. One is I wanted to uh, distill like 45 years worth of direct experience with cr core creatives and then be able to impart it in a way where ordinary people, you know, not the captains or titans of, of creativity, but then ordinary people could read the book called Creativity and then become more creative in a variety of ways in their personal life, their business life, their social life, so that we can extract the master creatives, but take some of uh, their formulas, their stencils, their templates, and put them to use with our own uh, everyday life. Can we take a step back and define that? You keep saying core creatives. What's a core creative? A core creative is somebody who spends time daily in meditation or in contemplation, reflecting on their own inner core. And the inner core is connected dynamically to what Carl Jung, the esteemed Swiss psychiatrist of Jungian psychology, he talked about it as this unending stream of infinite imaginative ideas that's always flowing. And all we need to do is to take time, whether by tracking our dreams or by meditating or doing some sort of spiritual practice or creative uh, writing, is to take time daily to tap into that stream. Um, I'll call it the, the core creativity stream that we're all capable of swimming in. And for example, when I mentioned Paul McCartney, um, so he, he has a dream in the middle of the night, and I think he was with his girlfriend, Jane Asher, at the time in London. And um, 
he wakes up in the middle of the night and turns to her and says something to the effect like, oh my God, I just had this extraordinary um, dream about um, this song. And she said something to the effect like, well, why don't you talk it into the tape recorder? Or he got up and he played the piano, he played it on the piano. Um, and he uh, wrote it down and then went back to sleep. And then he gets up in the morning and takes it out. And there's yesterday. Um, and then for a good month or two, he shopped all around um, uh, London uh, it, as if it was an orphan and he, wanting someone else to adopt it, thinking that somebody who was somebody else's his child, somehow he, he, he couldn't quite grok. He had just brought through this extraordinary masterpiece, but it came from his core creative flow. And I know in the book you talk about there's three stages of accessing core creativity. Can you share those with us? Yes. The first stage is what I call absorbing mind. And that's a stage where, and I apply it to myself, and most of the creators I interviewed in the book, they also apply um, this way of getting the ramp up to accessing something new, something that you've yet to give birth to from a creative um, direction. And in absorbing mind, I encourage people to um, go out, visit museums, go to concerts, go to art galleries, take trips to cities where you like Berlin, where you've never been before. In 1993, um, I was on the tail end of the uh, Zeropa tour with uh, U2 and was invited uh, graciously to have some after-hour drinks at the Hilton on St. Stephen's Green with one of the band members and his lovely uh, wife. And we were talking about creativity. It's just a personal, friendly uh, conversation, nothing professional. And um, I said, how did you guys get from Joshua Tree album to Aktung Baby? I mean, like, there's just no straight line there because the music and the lyrics and the entire feeling uh, and direction uh, of that uh, as a band completely went 180 degrees. And he said, um, well, one of us had the brainstorm that when we finished uh, Joshua Tree, we really had come to the end of the, that sound. And so we decided um, and somebody in the band uh, recommended it, that we would go for four to six months and live in Berlin and where it's dark and it's cloudy and it's rainy and it's filled with museums and underground music clubs and uh, the opera and music. And so for many, many months as a band, they uh, immersed themselves in, in the grittiness and that's what I call absorbing mind. You know, take yourself out of, uh, metaphorically, the Dublin of your everydayness life and immerse yourself. Find, find your own version of Berlin to go and to do things and live differently, eat different food, uh, be in a different culture. Um, and so that's absorbing mind. <laughs> that sitting at home, you know, I read art books, and books on design and photography and books about uh, great creatives throughout history, is taking time, um, books about Greece, looking at beautiful photographs um, on the internet. Um, there's a whole host of uh, websites uh, that you can um, uh, explore, things like photography and design. I'm trying to think of the Pinterest. Pinterest is a wonderful place to spend a couple of hours when you're trying to invent and in being in touch uh, with your core creativity. And then the second phase is after you've spent a considerable amount of time absorbing yourself and placing yourself, immersing yourself into creative environments <laughs> and sitting quietly with beautiful books on literature and art and philosophy and poetry and reading is the second stage is what I call open mind. An open mind 
consciousness is a state or a stage of consciousness where we do pay this extra special attention to what we're dreaming at night because I trust that my unconscious is oriented around three things. First and most, first and foremost, it's oriented around creativity. That my unconscious is always up to something creative. The second thing that I trust is my unconscious is imaginative. It has an infinite capacity to imagine, to invent, and to bring something fresh and unique and original forward. And the third thing that I trust my unconscious is always up to is that it's oriented towards mind, body, and spiritual healing. So if you take those three together, whether it's like a triangle of points of visitation, uh, metaphorically, when you meditate, you eventually will drop into what I call open mind. An open mind is a state of consciousness where all great creatives in history, Beethoven, Mozart, Tchaikovsky, Chopin, Beatles, Stones, U2, you open into an opening. It's a pool of creativity and creative flow. And then the third stage is what I called activating mind. And that what separates out creative people from successfully creative people is you have to take action. It's not enough just to have an idea, but you've got to take action. You know, if you have, uh, like Michelangelo did, you have the, uh, the vision of the Sistine Chapel, well, then you've got to get together with the Pope of the day or the Medici of the day and get funding. And or if, if you don't get funding, you still have to act and take action and have an action plan. That's the one thing most people don't do, take action. One of the things you talk about the book is fear. Why are people fearful of their creativity? The number one thing that I assessed from conducting many, many, many interviews is creative people have fear, but then they jump off the cliff. Most people are afraid to change. Whereas core creatives, they have a fear, but they jump, they leap. So they orient, and that's what makes creatives so fascinatingly interesting, is they have fear like the rest of us, but they don't let the fear keep them stuck. Unfortunately, most ordinary people, fear defines them. So we were talking about formulas in, in business that lead to success. Whether you've succeeded or you've failed, some people can be categorized as too fearful to change and to give up a certain mode of how they live in the world and how they conduct business in the world. And they want to hold on to, because in Buddhist psychology, we talk about the notion of attachment, is that people become attached to their original formula or they become attached to whatever kind of wealth they've accumulated. And then they get frightened and they start focusing on, and I'll give you a, a great example, is the late trapeze artist, tightrope walker, Valenda, from the Valendas. In the last couple of months um, of, of his life, he started, his wife said, he started to focus on being concerned about falling. And prior to that, and I think he was down in Cuba or Miami, Miami or Cuba, when he fell. But prior to that, she said he never, ever focused on falling. He never talked about it. He never dreamt about it. But the last two months of his life, he started dreaming about it. And if I had been counseling him, I would have said, I think you should attach a safety from here on out or you shouldn't uh, walk because I think your unconscious is telling you that there's an inherent danger. So people are afraid of taking the leap because they're afraid of losing what they have. But in the formula of core creatives, core creatives feel a sense of, a mild sense of fear of moving on to something new. But they won't let that fear get in the way. One of the, uh, I'll give you an example. One of them, um, 
the co-creators I interviewed in the book, the actor and musician Dennis Quaid. A prolific uh, career in, in film and television. And he has a band, Dennis Quaid and the Fox. Um, he writes music. They're recording down in, in Nashville as we speak. And he said when he was in his 20s and he was doing a show on Broadway, I said, how did you cope with like stage fright? You know, because stage fright was something that I, I had to struggle with earlier in my career when I had to give a talk. I once had to give a talk to 2,000 dentists in San Francisco, and I had cotton mouth. I was so anxious, and I thought that, you, well, you shouldn't um, bring a bottle of water up or suck on a lozenger or, or even tell the audience uh, how afraid I was. And I, when I was interviewing him in the last couple of years for the book, he said what he would do is he would sit on Broadway off stage and he would imagine that he would take all that anxiety and all that fear and he'd squish it together like a ball. And he'd squish it and squish it and squish it. And then he'd put it inside of his stomach. And then like a fireball, he'd walk out onto the stage and then boom it would just uh, ignite and off he'd be running and he wouldn't be thinking about being staged, uh, having stage fright. So a big key is recognize that you have fear, but harness the fear to move the horse of creativity in the direction that you want the horse of creativity to go in rather than in the direction of, of fear. And there's an old um, metaphysical saying, set your mind on what you want, and it, you will manifest it. So what you think about also determines, are you going to go away from your fear? Are you going to be consumed by your fear? Or are you going to go into your fear and harness the energy and then use the compass of the self creatively to set a new direction. And most of um, the entrepreneurs that I interviewed had a considerable amount of failure. Now, whether it was repetitive patterns of failure or just every 10 years, some business or investment went sideways, and they, they weren't afraid um, to try something new. They weren't afraid of, okay, I might fail, but I'm going to do it anyways. So what I always suggest to people is feel your fear creatively and then leap. Take that creative leap anyways, because that's how we separate ourselves and how we can use our fear. You know, we can mine it, harvest it. And I think one way to help with that, and you suggested in the book, is to create a council. What does that look like? All right. In the book, I talk about um, two concepts, the Council of Support, which grew out of my first book, Wise Mind, Open Mind, in that we all need, um, there was a very famous psychoanalyst in uh, London. His name was uh, Winnicott. And first he became a, a child analyst. And he wrote extensively. Uh, his papers on from pediatrics uh, to adulthood. And Winnicott had a very interesting saying. He said, <clears throat> when patients would tell him they'd be laying on the, the couch and be very upset and suffering and say they needed his support, <clears throat> and he'd say, we all need support. We all need support. We all need support. And so I use that concept to write about that if you want to expand, I call it the, your circle of creativity, is you need a wider circle or sphere of influence. In this wider sphere of influence, I call the council of support. And the council of support is what you want to do is you want to pick key figures like my aunt, aunt the banker, my parents, my scout master, my um, cross-country coach, my music uh, teacher and tutor, 
um, members of the group that I was playing music in uh, with high school. That was my beginning council of support. What you want to do is you want to um, gather around you key figures, people that can mentor you, coach you, counsel you, um, friends, fellow creatives <clears throat> from the same field you're in, and then invite other people um, and to get together, whether it's um, through the internet or in person. And then this council of support can then lead to fine tuning a second um, council that in core creativity, I write extensively about, and that's called the creativity pod. And the creativity pod, it's similar to the council of support, but it's an offshoot where you handpick people who also have creative uh, projects that they want to um, get off the ground. And you meet with them, whether it's weekly, two hours, or every other week, or once a month, or every three months. And um, you engage them to engage you, and you engage them. And it's a pot of creativity. It's a cauldron of alchemical ideas. And the one's creativity pot, I mean, meeting and getting together with fellow writers, uh, I got it this new book on co-creativity and so it does work and in a creativity part as well as the council of support people hold you accountable okay you said you were going to have your outline done by uh, june 1st it's july 4th we're meeting where's the outline and so it's done not in a combative way but in a um, loving supporting way to get you to um, put your feet in the fire or uh, kneel your feet to the floor of the deck and to move things along. And so a council of support and a creativity pod are both very sophisticated tools for helping somebody to move things uh, forward and move on down the road. Speaking of moving forward and taking action What's an action step people can take this week to move forward? First and foremost, action step that they can take is actually the opposite of action. It's to sit down and to close their eyes for five to 12 minutes and to pay attention to their breath and to wait and then wait in order to listen and then to listen in order to hear and hear in order to receive from the inside what's the new image or color or picture or what's coming through your creative unconscious that your unconscious wants you to listen to. So that's the first thing that I would suggest to everybody. The second thing, not, not to be um, sarcastic, but the second thing is to think about, well, of all the things that you need to do to take action, make a list, one, two, and three. The third is the least amount of difficulty that you'll have taking action. The second, and then the first is the most difficult project or step or phone call or email that you need to uh, uh, make or writing out an outline. And this week is after you sit down and you write out the one, two, three three most difficult things is on Monday, do number three. On Tuesday, do number two. And on Wednesday, have number three done. And that will give you a working formula so that next Monday, you'll have another one, two, and three. And you'll be well along your way. you got to take action. It's not yeah. enough just to have a, a wonderful idea. You've got to take action. Absolutely do. It's time to learn the secrets of life. What's your secret to living an abundant life? Accepting what is. You're not trying to change the world. You're accepting it as it is. 
accept what is first, and then focus on change. Okay. So accept. Start where we're at. Yes. Start where we're at. Are you swimming against the stream? Are you swimming with the stream? Or are you standing on the edge of the stream? First, know where you're at. Okay. What did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner? That the slower I go in everything, whether it's reading books, writing, eating, running, the Confucius philosophy that the slower you go creates an expansive arc. Whereas I always thought it was the opposite. Have an expansive arc and then slow down. Now I realize the slower I go, the more the arc expands. Most things in life are counterintuitive. Yes. Well said. If you were to give an 18-year-old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? It would be, don't think about what you should do or how you're going to make money. Think about what you love and apply what you're curious about, what your creative instincts are leading you to, and to immerse yourself in those ponds. And to trust swimming in those ponds will then be the blueprints that will be much more connected to your own rhythm and your soul's calling. And so to take time to really connect with the inner self first. People who spend their time doing what they love will outlast anyone who's doing it because they have to. Because when the times get tough, one of them will give up and one of them will just enjoy it and keep going. That's right. And what we know long-term um, health studies from both Stanford and Harvard is people that uh, chose occupations or creative outputs and avenues that were connected inherently to their creativity or to what they loved doing had long-term longevity acts of more health and, and vibrancy. Science proves out yep. what is out there. If people would like to learn more about you, about the book, what's the best way for them to do that? Best way is for the book, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any bookseller online, just look up Ron Alexander, Ronald Alexander, Core Creativity, The Mindful Way to Unlock Your Creative Self. <laughs> and uh, they can go to either corecreativity.com or ronaldalexander.com, uh, my website. And uh, there are all sorts of uh, programs and workshops and trainings and uh, explanation of uh, individual creativity coaching and uh, executive leadership coaching and somatic psychotherapy on those sites. And thank you for joining us today. Very much enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. Have you tapped into your core creativity? It's funny, I didn't think I was a creative, but the more I have the freedom to play and try things, the more creative I become. I don't think I appreciated that. And practice does make perfect. What creative ideas or activities do you have that you want to work on? Why not pick one, ignore the fear, and just do it? Let's not live with regrets. This week's action step was to sit and close your eyes for five to 12 minutes and breathe and listen to what your core has to say to you and the message it has for you. And the second action step was to write down three important items you need to take action on and rank them by difficulty and then do them in reverse order, one each, one every day next week. And then just rinse and repeat every week. And that's basically it. I think the biggest thing people do is they don't decide what they need to do tomorrow. And then they don't take action on them. It's really that simple. These are two excellent suggestions. And I will do both of these. I'm really great at taking action and getting things done. Next week, we've got 
Adrian Kohler to talk about fearless leadership and how to lead and just do wonderful things. Hey, do you know someone who might enjoy today's episode? Would you do me a favor and share it with them? I'd appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for listening. Have an abundant week.